friends, welcome to another session of the Why on Earth Community Stewardship and Sustainability Series. And I'm so overjoyed to have this opportunity to have with us Judith Schwartz today. And uh, welcome, Judy. Thank you. Uh, Judy, Judith uh, is the author of Cows Save the Planet, as well as Water in Plain Sight. I've actually got my copyright here of Water in Plain Sight, if you can see that. And um, Judy and I, we've been corresponding now for maybe something approaching two years and have connected, I think, primarily around soil-related issues. And uh, she is uh, an incredible expert on these topics. And it's such a joy, uh, Judy, to have this opportunity to chat with you and to share a bit of your work with the Why on Earth community. So thank you. Oh, my pleasure. So I, I thought it might be fun uh, just knowing that one of the things you talk about is this connection between soil and water. I thought it might be fun to hang behind me a couple of paintings. One is an homage to soil. Of course, that's on this side. And one is an homage to water. And uh, so perhaps we could kick off by having you share with us what is that connection and, and why why on earth why on earth is that important yeah so soil and water are intimately connected and the way i often talk about it is that we can think about soil as our best water infrastructure mm -hmm. you know when we think about water infrastructure we think about these big dams and you know channels and everything whisking water away from our cities where a lot of water causes, you know, storm surges and, you know, different, different problems. And so what happens is that we remove water from its intimate connection with the soil because water, because soil, when it's healthy, holds water. I mean, one statistic that I often use, and this is from the USDA, is that one additional 1% increase of soil organic carbon, because when you have carbon in the soil, that's healthy in the soil, that's a lot of organic matter, and that acts as a sponge, that represents an additional 25,000 gallons of water that can be held on the land. So there's a huge connection, because if you have soil that doesn't have a lot of carbon in it, if it's essentially dirt, well, that, that soil can't hold water. And that's what we see all over. That's the backstory to floods and droughts and wildfires and all these other challenges that we have. Oh, including um, pollution in our waterways. Right. All right. I want to make sure I get this right. I'm going to make a note actually of this. So we're talking about in, in soil, a 1% increase of uh, organic matter in soil equates to a 25,000 gallon additional uh, water absorption capacity. In what area is that? Per, per acre. Per acre. Yeah. Okay. That's tremendous. That's yeah. tremendous. Yes, it wow. is. <laughs> I'm writing it down. Um, and, and what can people do? Of course, many of our friends who are farmers, uh, folks who are managing large landscapes are doing incredible regenerative work with soil to build up that soil carbon content, that organic matter in the soil. What can regular folks do perhaps in our own uh, homes, yards, neighborhoods uh, to help build soil carbon and help uh, create a better uh, water infrastructure, if you will? Well, the first thing to do is to stop putting chemicals on your lawn. Now, this is something that I'm exploring in my community because you're, you know, because, you know, when, when I look at green spaces, I don't know what the town is doing. You know, I learned that the town often uses um, herbicides to manage some of the green space. Um, so, but stop definitely stop doing that for many, many reasons. Okay. So we can take, um, well, well, let's take fertilizer because people often don't understand that. So when you have synthetic nitrogen fertilizer, 
you're adding nitrogen to the soil and, you know, nitrogen is important in the soil. And they're just like, we have a carbon cycle. We have a nutrient cycle, which is driven by nitrogen. So there's all this barter that goes on in the ground, in the soil. You've got all these microorganisms doing all this stuff. And so basically you've got the, you've got the plant and then the plant is um, creating carbon from sunlight and, and water and the process of photosynthesis and sending carbon down into the soil. And all these microorganisms are very excited about this carbon and they're feeding on carbon and they're trading nutrients with the plant. And one of those nutrients is nitrogen. And when we add nitrogen to the soil, that messes up that whole barter system. So that's that's turning off the mechanism is telling the plant, oh, you've got this. You don't need to interact with all these other microorganisms. So you don't get carbon flowing into the soil in the same way being taken up by microorganisms. So, um, yeah, so there's a, there's a really interesting scientist that talks a lot about the soil carbon sponge. He was just on a soil carbon sponge tour through North America um, his name is Walter Yenna, and I met up with him in Kansas. We were speaking in a few different things, to, um, events together, and he said, and this totally blew me away, that for every, like every excess gram of nitrogen, fertil of, of, you know, mainly nitrogen fertilizer. And we know that much of, the, because nitrogen fertilizer is relatively cheap, people put on much more than they need and people, we don't really need it anyway. Um, that um, because there is nitrogen in the, in, in the landscape and there in the atmosphere, um, nitrogen, you know, there's a ton of nit nitrogen in the atmosphere and, um, there are microbes in the soil that can convert it to, to nitrogen that's able to be taken up by plants. But what he said is that like every one gram of, of um, excess nitrogen flowing into the soil is, it represents 30 grams of carbon being volatized, meaning being put into the atmosphere where it, get, it oxidizes, it combines with oxygen and is then CO2. I mean, that just blew me away. And the ex I asked him for an explanation and it had to do with what the fungi and the soil are doing. But anyway, um, that's really important. We know that too much nitrogen actually ca it causes nit a lot of nit nitrous oxide, but there's this carbon dynamic too. So- It's such a powerful, I think thing for us to understand about this incredible planet. And I, I like to use the word miraculous. That's the word that resonates for me when thinking about this amazing planet earth that we live on and nitrogen is so abundant, right? My understanding is what 70 some percent of the atmosphere. Yes. Uh, and my grandpa, I remember would often describe a snow, a wet snow in the spring as poor man's fertilizer. Um, and there's actually a, uh, something going on. That's one of the ways in which atmospheric nitrogen is making its way into the soil. Uh, of course, the incredible complex, uh, activities of the soil microbiome, all of those little critters in the soil is a huge part of what's going on with nitrogen and with carbon, as you're saying. Uh, and it strikes me, I've got friends and family who think of gardening or farming uh, in terms of needing to apply nitrogen. And if we're not doing that, somehow we're gonna produce less food or perhaps uh, have fewer flowers in our garden or whatever it might be. And I think there's a real opportunity here for people to understand that the miraculous mechanisms of this planet have already got us covered uh, in this regard. And that much of what we've been doing over the last hundred years or so has actually been incredibly disruptive uh, to those natural cycles. Um, and of course, we, we know, looking at the history of this, that uh, nitrogen is a central ingredient in the munitions we 
uh, utilized in World War One and utilized in World War Two. And my grandfather fought in that war against the fascists in Europe. And then we, as a nation here in the United States, made a decision to keep that nitrogen production at elevated levels and went into agricultural uses uh, now in addition to munitions uses. And so uh, it's, a, it's a complex story. And it's one that we get to make choices about now in our own homes and yards and neighborhoods. My hope is that as people hear from you uh, and some of the other experts out there in the world talking on this, it, it helps us decide, you know what, I don't need to buy that nitrogen fertilizer. What I'm going to do is start working with the soil microbiome and start uh, collaborating and cooperating with this incredibly rich and complex system that is naturally there. Absolutely. Um, when I was writing my last book, I was talking to Aust another Australian scientist, Christine Jones, who has the, the website amazingcarbon.com, which I find very memorable. Um, so what she was pointing out, and here I was sitting outside, um, I live in southern Vermont, and she said, when plants are deprived of nitrogen, they turn yellow. And if you look out in a natural system, you see green plants without yellow. And there I was, you know, just like, I think it was in June, just like, you know, the land, my landscape is right now. And all I see is, is green. And so that means that those plants are getting nitrogen somehow. So that was really powerful. But this whole thing about what we think green space should look like just has us totally addicted to nitrogen fertilizer. And I was talking to a fellow um, um, who um, runs a, or I guess he sold it, but um, ran a, an organic lawn service. And he talks about how the notion that the types of grass that we're supposed to have on our lawns um, and the way that they're supposed to look sets up a condition that we are dependent on all of this whole you know, this, this, this whole set of stuff that we need to buy yeah. because the Bermuda grass, I think that it's life cycle is such that by the middle of the summer, you're going to, you know, need a lot of help. It needs more water. It needs more nitrogen. And he was saying that even something as simple as adding clover to the mix, clover is a legume. So it fixes nice nitrogen at the root will benefit but somehow we have this idea that clover is clovers are weeds of course red clover is our state flower um but you know but but still yeah it, it sets up this kind of ridiculous counterproductive dynamic absolutely you know we uh have recently been spending a fair bit of time with the herbalist brigitte mars a uh, dear friend and who is educating so many people and she talks a lot about the dandelions and that we regard often dandelions as weeds because uh, somehow they don't look like what we imagine is the ideal landscape or something like this. And it turns out they are one of the most important food sources early in the spring for the pollinators, the, the bees and others. And as we're becoming good stewards of our places, I think that to connect some of these dots in our own homes in our own neighborhoods becomes extremely powerful. And we begin to see the positive cascading effects of taking good care of soil, taking good care of water, not poisoning any of this, and taking good care of these plants who have incredible purpose and virtue. And I forget who said it, but somebody is uh, quoted as saying that weeds are what we call plants whose virtues we have not yet discovered. Uh, these plants have incredible roles and functions to play in these ecosystems. And by golly, we get to play with them and be good friends of theirs. Right. So the other, so the other flip, in addition to not putting nitrogen fertilizer on is not putting on herbicides and pesticides because there are, oh, there's always, you can call it collateral damage, but it, I mean, you're just, once you destroy one thing, you're destroying something else, and then you have that kind of cascading effect. Now, for um, adding, keeping nitrogen going in the system, there's another way to do it, and that is what I'm 
experimenting with right now. And it's funny, you, you mentioned your, your backdrop. Um, my backdrop here on my chair is a, <laughs> is a sheep hide from a um, friend of mine here in Vermont that run um, Jesse McDougall, who has a, a, a farm, a regenerative farm called Studio Hill Farm. And I recommend people looking that up because they are telling beautiful stories about their farm and how every year the biodiversity improves. I was just up there the other day and they're getting a lot of bobolinks, which have been disappearing in this region or the, the numbers have dwindled, but just, you know, just something magical appears. Just, you know, you improve the land and there it goes. But anyway, the experiment that I'm doing is having sheep on the landscape. Ah. And this is, this is an experiment. It's going to be for my next book. My next book is called restoration flash mob. So it's about restoring the earth. Okay. So it's, it kind of articulates the ecosystem restoration, regenerative agriculture movement, which is growing. And there's going to be a narrative thread of restoring the land here on our property, we own 12 acres. And what was happening is I was beginning to feel like I was living in two worlds that here I'd go to some place in Africa or in Mexico or in Canada where they're restoring the land. And then I come back and I sit at my computer and, you know, wait a second, there's, there's something missing here. Um, so I wanted to see, just kind of, you know, ask some questions about our land. So it turns out there's a, through our little network and the underground um, sheep um, community here that I found someone who really was just as happy to, to have fewer sheep during this summer season. And so um, enter six lovely sheep onto our land. And so we're still getting the handle, uh, handle on the moving them, but it's really, really interesting. And I'm telling you, you will not, look at green space the same way again, because now I look at it and I see food for animals. So if you think about it, when we mow our lawns, that has huge number of impacts. You're compacting the soil, which means that you don't get the same aeration and water flow. Okay. With the lawnmower, of course, right. you're, burning, you're burning fossil fuels. You, you, you know, you're doing all these other th other things. And, you know, and the noise, uh, okay, so you're doing all these other things. Whereas if you have sheep eating all that, that excess green stuff, that's kept uh, biologically alive. That's creating wool and meat and hides and love because they are beautiful and so sweet and they snuggle together. And they make me happy when I see them. So there you go. And why, I mean, why wouldn't we have them everywhere? Think of all the new work for shepherds for, or for people that maybe go around and bring their sheep to people's lawns. And I, I don't see a downside at all. So yeah. It's really quite extraordinary. I mean, I could know before I had the sheep on the land, I could know this intellectually, but when you actually see when we move the sheep from one paddock where they've pretty much eaten down, you know, they've kind of, you know, gotten as low as we want the grass to grow, to go and then bring them to a new paddock you know, new fresh grass with all, you know, with dandelions and all these wonderful weedy things that, you know, whose names I don't even know. They are just so joyous. Mm. I, you know, I mean, they're so excited. What a delight. <laughs> You know, okay, I got to really quickly take a pause and give a, a shout out to the Why on Earth community. And for folks who are, are tuning in uh, to our podcast, I want to mention you can go to whyonearth.org uh, slash market and use the code podcast to get some special deals on our audiobooks and uh, other uh, great listening content that we've put together for you. And uh, also with the Why on Earth community, I am so excited. I actually 
Judy, I don't think I recall you mentioning the name of the book you're working on, Restoration Flash Mob. And I'm so excited because with the Why Earth community, one of our big initiatives now is working with a probiotic uh, biodynamic soil activator in communities all over uh, this continent, really, to help engage in relationship with place, with soil, and to help get those positive cascading effects going with that so soil microbiology. And we're now, we'll be doing some things in cities, suburban areas, rural areas. And part of the fun is we get to put on a little backpack after stirring this up in some water and literally walking through our neighborhood along the sidewalk or in the park, imagine we get to sprinkle a little bit of this incredible goodness uh, all over and really start to engage in a process of healing that is joy-filled and, to be honest, quite a lot of fun and not technically difficult to do. Uh, and so with, with the wide earth community, one of the things I'm so excited about is we can work with folks living in all kinds of different situations and settings. Now, some of my friends perhaps in Midtown Manhattan aren't going to bring sheep into their situation, uh, but we can still work with soil absolutely wherever we are. And uh, it's just, it's an incredible opportunity we have really for all of us on the planet, I believe. Yeah, you just you just start looking at, at land, just how much land isn't being used and you know the folly of us saying well you know we don't have we we don't have enough food to support everybody well there's food happening in my yard and you know we can you know grow tree trees and a friend of mine is is just starting to have a a, a perennial food garden i mean there's just so many opportunities Yes, yes. We really, we get to work with the animals, with the soil microbiome, with the plants and the trees, and, and, and in a sense, collaborate with those forces and energies that want to have places feel like what we would imagine the Garden of Eden to feel like. We get to do this in cities. We get to do this in rural landscapes. There's so much abundance and so much that wants to happen if we can just, you know, stop the practices that are inhibiting this and interrupting this and interfering with this, and then start to uh, work with these forces collaboratively, cooperatively, gosh, and it turns out, like you're saying, it makes you happy. It turns out it's going to enhance our own quality of life in the process. Of, of course. I mean, it is sort of crazy that we, that, the way that we think our landscapes should look are this this kind of static green kind of shag carpet. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, yeah, there's there's so much we can do, and yet the way that our our systems are, I mean, it makes me nuts. Down at at the bottom of I live on a mountain a mountain slope, and down at the bottom of the mountain road, um, people are own a dairy farmer owns the land and they're putting GMO corn on the ground to feed the cattle. I mean, this is insane. Whereas all that land, they could be managing that land with the animals, of course, or with sheep or with, I mean, those cows shouldn't even be eating GMO corn or corn right. at all for that matter. Corn that at all. Takes right. up all that land that ties up all that land. Yes. Yeah, we we know and 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 share with folks that uh, one of the ways we're causing distress and disease in our world by is by uh, overloading cows with corn, creating a condition called acidosis. It's actually acidifying their bodies. And it's one of the reasons conventional uh, cattle and dairy industry folks are having to use all of these antibiotics and so forth. The, the immune systems of those poor creatures are actually in the process of collapsing. And, and there's almost in that model, this race to the slaughterhouse where you're trying to get as much weight on the hoof, it's called, of that animal to sell into the market 
uh, before that poor animal actually collapses from being so overwhelmed by a disease. And uh, feeding, feeding corn to these animals that are beautifully designed to eat grasses with their many stomachs, they have this incredible microbiome of their own. I heard recently mentioned up at a biodynamic farm we love visiting that the nutrient input to output with cattle working with grass is something like uh, a, a one for every one uh, unit in, we get three units out in that microbial rich uh, manure that gets back into that landscape and back with that soil. And so my goodness, this whole, uh, this whole setup has been uh, created by incredible intelligence, nature's intelligence. And if we might cultivate a bit of humility and come to understand really how uh, perfect so much of these systems have been created naturally and, and work to co collaborate instead of you know effectively waging war against soil and, and causing incredibly uh, sad uh, scenarios for animals and, and for people. Right, right. To celebrate the biodiversity yeah. as opposed to trying to, you know, clobber it with, um, by thinking of weeds as, as undesirable plants, as opposed to, as you said, we don't know the benefits, the plants that we don't know the benefits of yet, yeah. but also they're a source of information because depending on the condition of the soil, different plants will show up to try to fix the soil. So once we start to understand that, we can say, oh, if this particular plant is showing up now, well, that's telling me that the soil is too acid, the soil is too compacted. You know, for compaction, we have all those um, taproot plants that show up. And that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to break up the compaction. I love this. So it's as if, if, we, if we've got a species of plant moving into our place that we don't necessarily uh, want or understand why uh, we might uh, appreciate its being there, uh, in a sense, we ought to come to appreciate it's actually giving us a message, right? It's, it's telling us a signal about what's going on in this place. It's not actually the problem that there is a problem. It's an indication that there might be a problem to work with. Exactly. So I guess one thing that we all need to do and everybody, you know, we all get into habits of thought and, and just going along with the way that things have always been done is to, is to pause and say, Hmm, maybe I don't need to put this on our property or maybe in our children's schoolyard, we parents can get together and try to do something different rather than have glyphosate on to make it a, you know, a smoother, um, more uniform play area. Uh, right. And also, okay. yeah. Um, you know, when you say, Oh no, I don't like this weed. Well, wait a second. Hey, you know, yes. I mean, dandelions are beautiful. They're beautiful. They really are. Yeah. Well, what if our schools all over become increasingly these hubs where soil regeneration is occurring and, soil amendments and really soil and land medicines are being created that can be broadcast into those surrounding communities. What if that's the world we get to be in here quite soon? Sounds good to me. Awesome, Judy. Well, I want to, I want to be sure to mention that for folks who want to see more about your books, Cows Save the Planet, Water in Plain Sight, forthcoming Restoration Flash Mob, uh, to get to Judith D. Schwartz, dot com is that right yes and uh the spelling will appear in the video so that's um going to be there visually for folks but can you spell it for folks who might just be listening in okay um judith j-u-d-i-t-h then d schwartz s-c-h-w-a-r-t-z and then just my name dot com that's so beautiful well judy i am just thrilled to have this opportunity to chat with you today and, and also really perhaps uh, as importantly to be able to share some of your knowledge and wisdom with others uh, whom we're connected to and sharing this with. So thanks for taking time out of your busy day uh, to be with us. 
Okay, my, my pleasure. I'll be checking on the on the sheep pretty soon. And we'll see what they all their fertilizing and moving around and eating the plants does for the land. I hope we get to see some uh, pictures and videos here with this as well. Yes, I'm sure. Beautiful. Well, thank you, Judy. Okay, thank you. Thank you.